The Nile, secretive movement, a darkness in daylight, bringer of life to the people of Egypt. Long before the first pharaohs signaled the start of their civilization by building wondrous monuments along these black shores, the Nile flowed freely here. It was the source of life for small bands of wanderers who lived along these fertile banks. Fish and fowl were abundant, and there were crocodiles and hippopotamuses to hunt. Each spring, the river would flood, depositing a layer of rich, dark mud from which wild barley grew. These prehistoric people of the Nile harvested their bounty with stone blades and arrowheads. Life here was so dependent on the river that the Greek historian Herodotus would later call Egypt the gift of the Nile and the temple of the world. Scratch upon a rock on these cliffs or deserts of the Nile Valley and the mark is left forever. Into this land, 3,000 years before Christ, would be the central figures of ancient Egyptian civilization, the pharaohs. From the beginning, the land along the Nile was divided naturally into two regions, the narrow river valley that extended northward from the African continent was called Upper Egypt. The lush delta region where the branches of the Nile empty into the Mediterranean Sea was called Lower Egypt. Joined together, this would become the Egypt of history. In this narrow valley, the monuments were built, the inscriptions written, and a mysterious religion and philosophy developed. This valley of the Nile, protected by the deserts which close it in, is the land of the pharaohs. The word pharaoh means simply great house, and it was the mission of the pharaohs to establish their spiritual and political supremacy over all that lived in the land. The foremost symbol of this kingship was the crown. One of the two most important was the white crown a tall, slender headdress with a rounded top. It signified its wearer as the ruler of Upper Egypt. The red crown signified the ruler of Lower Egypt. When the two were combined and worn at once, the crown signified the pharaoh of all Egypt. The pharaoh also carried ceremonial tools called the crook and the flail. It is believed that the crook was shaped after a shepherd's staff and characterized the pharaoh as a shepherd of his people. The flail was symbolic of both a weapon and a tool for threshing wheat. When crossed across the pharaoh's chest, they signified his power to lead, protect, and provide for his people. Nearly every aspect of ancient Egyptian life was believed to be controlled by gods, Often the god was represented by an animal, a reflection of the awe with which these Nile dwellers regarded the creatures that shared their fertile homeland. The ruling pharaoh was believed to be the embodiment of the hawk-headed god, Horus, ruler of the sky and lord of heaven. Above all, the ancient Egyptians believed their life on earth and the order of the universe was controlled by a force they called Ma'at. Pharaoh's job description might be described as maintaining Ma'at. Everything must function according to Ma'at or the universe, the ordered universe, might collapse into chaos. Egyptian civilization began when Upper and Lower Egypt were brought together under one warrior king in the year 3150 BC. He is believed to have conquered his enemy in a fertile field of papyrus to become the first pharaoh of Egypt. 
The physical evidence for this comes from Upper Egypt in the city of Heracanopolis, along the west bank of the Nile. Excavations have revealed a monumental piece of dark green slate, the Narmer Palette. It is the earliest historical record of Egypt and was carved 3,000 years before Christ. This is a replica of the Narmer Palette, uh, about third scale, so the original uh, would have been much larger than this. The classical interpretation of the Narmer Palette has been that this pharaoh, Narmer, um, was the king who unified the country. And uh, this document has really uh, played a major role in that interpretation. Hieroglyphs of the pharaoh's name depict a catfish above a chisel and form the word Narmer, a name that translates literally as angry catfish. This may sound to us rather amusing. However, the Nile has several species of electrically charged catfish that are capable in, of inflicting a very painful uh, electrical jolt. Uh, so that I think the uh, name really has some resonance. According to legend, Narmer burned the enemy village and killed each of its soldiers. The reverse side of the Narmer palette depicts such a scene after the pharaoh's battle. In front of the, the king and the followers of Horus is the remains of a battlefield with rows of beheaded individuals with their heads between their legs. Narmer began a bloodline that marked the rise of the first dynasty of pharaohs over 5,000 years ago. 29 such dynasties, or distinct family lines of rulers, would follow. The changes due to either lack of an heir or by the wars and political infighting that lay in the future of the pharaohs, a period that would span some three millennia. In order to secure his conquest, the pharaoh Narmer probably married a princess of northern origin. He then moved north along the Nile and founded his residence city at a site known as White Walls. Here, in 3050 BC, he was succeeded to the throne by his son, whose name found on a simple shard of pottery meant fighting hawk. He was the pharaoh Hor Aha. Hor Aha's greatest achievement was the founding of the city of Memphis on the site of what had been his father's residence, White Walls. This city would grow into the political and religious capital of ancient Egypt. Made of mud and wood, it has all but vanished. But the Greek historian Manetho leaves an impression of this city of white walls. Memphis was by far the largest city I had ever seen. A colossal wall of pearly limestone encloses the city proper. Within the wall, many temples rise from the enormous spread of brown brick houses, and around them tower an army of gigantic statues. The pharaoh and his family lived in a palace inside the great white wall. The interior was brightly painted with scenes of Egyptian life. The wood beam ceilings were supported by massive columns of stone. The pharaoh's mourning began with a ritual bath that was witnessed by members of his court and his attendants. Because he was required to appear before his people dressed as a god, hygiene and appearance consumed a great deal of King Horaha's time. During this period in Memphis, the hippopotamus was a prevailing symbol in Egyptian culture. Hunting them, in fact, was considered a great sport of the nobles and pharaohs like Horaha, who pursued them in the marshes along the swamps at the edge of the Nile. It was on such a hunt that Egypt would see its pharaoh, Horaha, killed at the age of 62. According to the legend told by an ancient priest, Horaha was carried away from his people in the jaws of a hippopotamus, but did the pharaoh Huraha really die this way? The hippopotamus also has a religious implication because the male hippopotamus was the embodiment of the god of evil called Seth or Set, 
S-E-T-H. And one wonders, with this story preserved by a priest, whether it's a reflection somehow of the king being carried away by the embodiment of evil. Perhaps the 62-year-old pharaoh really was carried away by old age, and the ancients attributed his death to their god Seth, the bringer of fierce storms of the desert, whom the Egyptians sought to appease. We may never know how the pharaoh Huraha really died, but we can visit his tomb in search of clues at an ancient burial ground on the edge of the desert. The city of Abydos was begun as a burial site by the earliest pharaohs to honor the god Osiris, Lord of the Dead. It was the legendary rebirth of his body that gave rise to the ancient Egyptian belief in life after death. Forty feet below the desert surface is what remains of the Osirion, the temple at Abydos, where the ancient Egyptians worshipped the god Osiris as a symbol of resurrection. Its walls are inscribed with chapters from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, a set of instructions designed to enable the deceased to safely pass through to the next world. Until now, most bodies had been simply buried in a shallow pit. The natural drying effects of the desert sand against the corpse resulted in a withered human form in a very short time. To shield their earthly remains for all eternity, the pharaohs of the first dynasty built sturdy tombs here. Once buried at Abydos, the pharaohs believed they would join their god in the afterlife and indeed continue to rule and keep order in the universe forever. The tomb that awaited the pharaoh at Abydos was called Amastaba, the Egyptian word for bench, made to endure forever. The mastaba was built of sun-baked mud bricks with a flat roof and sloping sides. Inside were compartments stocked with an array of food, tools, and furniture intended to fortify the king for eternity. Under this structure was a shaft that led to an underground chamber lined with brick. There the pharaoh's body would rest, and the shaft would be filled with stone to make the tomb inaccessible. Most scholars agree that the ruins of this tomb, which archaeologists call Tomb B-19, once held the remains of the pharaoh Horaha. Around him were the burial pits of his faithful servants, concubines, and even pet dogs, who were all sacrificed and expected to accompany him into the afterlife. In time, such sacrifices ceased, and burial near the pharaoh was reserved for royal family and valued subjects. Another tomb close by was labeled with the name Bernerib, which translates literally to sweet heart. It is possible that this was the tomb of Horaha's queen, or possibly his favorite concubine. The death of the pharaoh Huraha marked the start of a period of growth and prosperity for Egyptian civilization that would last for more than 800 years. Memphis was the hub of culture and trade. Workers unloaded cargoes of livestock and vegetables that came from Upper Egypt. Gold, ivory, and precious stones were brought up from Nubia in the south. The Egyptians preserved some scenes of this ancient life in wooden models. From these, we know that barley was ground and kneaded into dough for large quantities of bread. Cows were slaughtered for meat, the preferred food of the noble class. A powerful country needed administration. These tasks fell to a special class of ancient Egyptian, the scribes. The scribes are very important because uh, they really represent the official class, the, the, the bureaucrats who make up the government, uh, who really made Egyptian culture possible. The pharaoh was the leader, but without the bureaucratic structure to, to fulfill what he thinks is needed, uh, the Egyptians couldn't have achieved what they had to achieve. 
But it's important to remember that only maybe 5% of the Egyptian population at any time were actually literate. As a practical matter, the pharaoh had to delegate most of his duties to officials called viziers, second only to a pharaoh in status. These Egyptian high officials were schooled as scribes and were often depicted sitting cross-legged with their papyrus laid across their lap. This was the customary posture for writing. Not only did the scribe ensure the pharaoh's wishes were carried out, he ensured a record would be left for history. By the end of the second dynasty in 2700 BC, the wall of lists of Abydos tells us that 22 pharaohs had reigned over Egypt since Horaha founded Memphis, but little more is known about them beside their names and what they meant. One pharaoh's name would read Hotep Sekemwe, or God of Pleasing Powers. Another was Seth Peribsum, which meant simply powerful in heart. What else we know is that their burial mastabas would be built closer to the capital city, Memphis. These grew more imposing and elaborate. Some reached 17 feet high with as many as 70 chambers. The construction of ever more elaborate monuments to these pleasing and powerful pharaohs indicates increasing confidence, wealth, and knowledge. The Egyptians soon developed new skills in building and architecture. A trend towards greater and greater beauty and excellence led here to Saqqara. Located south of the modern city of Cairo, this remarkable stone edifice is the funerary complex of King Djoser, the first pharaoh of the Third Dynasty. With the reign of Djoser, which began in about 2630 BC, the power of the pharaoh was absolute. Everyone, from the proudest administrator to the lowliest slave, was subject to his dictates. It was Djoser, whose name meant the most sacred one, that first began to explore the vast mineral wealth of the Sinai Peninsula that lay across the Gulf of Suez to the east. Here he would discover rich deposits of copper and turquoise that added to his wealth. He sent boats up the Nile to extend his rule and the borders of Egypt as far south as Aswan. To proclaim his exalted status, Djoser commissioned the first pyramid ever built in Egypt, the Step Pyramid. 200 feet high, the towering six-tiered step pyramid dominates the horizon and the elaborate burial complex which surrounds it. King Djoser's burial complex is very important because it is the first monumental uh, building built entirely out of stone the first time in history. Even more important, it gives us the idea of how a funerary complex is going to look like in Egypt from that time on. As a burial monument, it was truly a staircase to heaven. As an architectural achievement, it pays homage to the pharaoh Djoser's mysterious chief architect and scribe, Imhotep. An inscription from his period contained this tribute. Seal bearer of the king of Egypt, one who is near the head of the king, director of the great mansion, royal representative, high priest of Heliopolis, Imhotep, the carpenter and the sculptor. Imhotep, I suppose in a modern idiom, we call him the Leonardo da Vinci of ancient Egypt. He was brilliant. He was everything. He was second only to the king. He was the vizier, the chief statesman. He had many high titles. But who was he? We don't really know. All we know is his status at the time, that he was the, the genius who built the stone pyramid. The tomb Imhotep designed for the pharaoh Djoser took the old mastaba form to new heights. Imhotep actually built six mastabas of diminishing size, one on top of another, by assembling hundreds of thousands of white limestone blocks. The result was a monument to his king that could be seen for miles on the desert horizon. 
The building of this first pyramid also coincided with Joja's choice of the sun god, Re, as the country's dominant deity. To honor Re, the temples adjoining the pyramids would be built with their entrances toward the east to face the rising sun. The complex was enclosed by a wall 30 feet high with many false entrances. This served as a symbolic setting for Joja's Hepsed Festival, a ceremony that celebrated the pharaoh as a magical symbol of fertility. It involved the pharaoh stepping through a ritual course that represented the four corners of Egypt. Inside one of the step pyramids galleries, a relief depicts Joja eternally stepping through the Hepsed Festival as his court recited a pious incantation. Lord of destiny, creating the plenteous harvest, pillar of the sky, support of the earth, leader who directs the two banks of the Nile. There is plenteous harvest wherever his sandals may be. The Hepsed Festival uh, took place about every 30 years of rain of a particular pharaoh. And it was meant to be a rather civilized um, way of rejuvenating uh, life in Egypt and prosperity and to ensure that they would, they would have this. In other cultures, uh, very often, they would kill the king and then there would be a new young king coming onto the throne, but the Egyptians did not do that. They had a ritual for rejuvenation and the king would stay in power. Joja would reign for only 19 years, and we may never know whether his Hebsed court was ever used for the festival of his rejuvenation. We do know that when he died in 2649 BC, he had begun a legacy of pyramid building in ancient Egypt that would be copied and refined for 2,000 years. The name Snefru meant bringer of beauty, and his reign over Egypt would last 24 years. Snefru's predecessor, Djoser, had pushed the Egyptian border as far south as Aswan. Now Snefru sought to stretch his influence further, sending a campaign deep into Nubia to settle in the city of Buhen. This was used as a base for mining expeditions, trade, and conquest. He is said to have returned with 7,000 captive Nubians, presumably to use as laborers, and 200,000 head of cattle. This carving celebrates a raid on turquoise mines in the Sinai Peninsula and depicts Snefru killing an enemy. Its inscription calls the pharaoh a great god who conquers the foreign lands. Another of the chief commodities sought by the pharaoh was timber. Much wood was needed to make furniture and provide beams for the homes of the wealthy. But such trees were scarce in Egypt and the nearest source would require the Egyptians to travel by sea. The pharaoh ordered construction of 60 merchant ships Soon there were fleets of graceful sailing vessels en route to Byblos in Lebanon. One of Snefru's scribes would record the bringing of 40 ships filled with cedar logs. Wall inscriptions from this time also tell us that Snefru awarded estates built of cedar logs and mud bricks to his high officials. But he was careful that they were widely separated to discourage them from banding together to form their own sub-kingdom. Still, the king found time to celebrate. By all accounts, life was sweet under Snefru's rule. Egypt in the third millennium BC was a land of peace and plenty. Formal gatherings of nobles were hosted by the new pharaoh and his queen. Members of the court feasted on figs and fattened ducks. These people of ancient Memphis were lovers of beauty and fashion. They wore wigs, eye paint, and fine linen robes when they wore much at all. 
The ancient Egyptians also paid great attention to fragrance because body odor was a sign of sinfulness. For this reason, cones of perfumed fat were worn on the heads of eligible women. Over the course of a long, hot evening, the cones would melt and run down over their bodies. Another sign of the pharaoh's style of rule comes from a papyrus which recounts how a bored King Snefru had himself rowed around a lake by a young, beautiful woman wearing only fishnets. Ultimately, the ancient people of Egypt were bound to the past as embodied by the spirit of the departed. For this reason, it was only natural that the enduring symbols of the culture were mansions for the dead the pyramids. The pharaoh Snefru would move the royal burial ground yet again, not back to Abydos, but to a new site along the Nile called Dashur. It is here that he would build the first true pyramids. For much of this century, this site has been closed to visitors and seen only by a handful of archaeologists. Newly opened, the site offers a rare glimpse of Snefru's spectacular constructions as they dominate the desolate, almost lunar horizon here. Rising 341 feet from the desert floor, this is the Bend Pyramid, the first that Snefru would have built for himself. Snefru named it the Gleaming Pyramid of the South, and its shape led some scholars to suggest that the pharaoh died suddenly and his pyramid had to be finished hastily. In truth, the curious shape reveals much about Snefru's pyramid builders. The Bent Pyramid is probably one of the first major lemons that we can uh, find in history. When they st originally started building the pyramid, um, the Egyptian architects didn't realize that the ground on which the pyramid was built could not carry all that weight. So as a result, when they got halfway up, the uh, interior of the pyramid started cracking. Uh, there were all kinds of structural problems. So one of the ways they tried to fix it was to change the angle of the pyramid to a less steep slope so that there would be less mass of rock on it. Inside, Snefru had this limestone relief of himself placed on the wall of a chamber. It depicts him dressed for his renewal or Hepzed festival and wearing the double crown that signifies him as the ruler of Upper and Lower Egypt. Outside his misshaped pyramid, he supervised the building of an elaborate funeral temple, part of which can still be seen. I think the pharaohs kept very close tabs on their monuments, especially their funerary monuments, their pyramids and mortuary temples. And they would probably have been there quite often to see it firsthand how things were going, because no matter how powerful the pharaoh was when he was alive, his eternal um, prosperity depended on having the right tomb. And so in a way, for them personally, this was one of the most important events of their reign. And it was very unfortunate if you were a chief architect and something uh, really went wrong, which occasionally did. Such was the final case of Snefru's bent pyramid. Its chambers would remain forever empty, but his architects were not punished. Instead, one mile to the north, they went on to build a masterpiece, the most striking edifice at Dashur, the Red Pyramid. Standing 344 feet high, this is the first true smooth-sided pyramid to be built in the world. Its name derives from the rock it was built with. Rich in iron oxide, the stone takes on a reddish cast in the desert sunlight. The design of the Snefru's Red Pyramid closely followed the emergence of the sun god Ray as the country's dominant deity. The pyramid was conceived to resemble a sunburst in stone. 
its sides reproducing the slant of the sun's rays as they angle toward the Earth through a cloud break. The pyramid also represented the pharaoh's divine place in Egyptian society. The king is at the apex, the pharaoh, and it spreads down, widening out. The immediate family are the closest and high portions until you get right down to the broad base. It tells us how unified the kingdom was how the king, the pharaoh, could call upon forces to build. And people were pleased to work on this because it was a monument to the king when he became a god after he died. And in so doing, it ensured their own well-being on earth. Ironically, the very top or capstone of the Red Pyramid that symbolized Snefru has fallen to the ground where it has been preserved. In a mastaba south of the pyramid were buried Snefru's high priest, Rahotep, and his wife, Norfred. They were represented by painted limestone statues. The Egyptians believed that such realistic sculpture would help a spirit to recognize a tomb as its home in the afterlife. Their features offer an exceptional look at how an ancient Egyptian would have appeared. Early explorers were so startled by the lifelike glass eyes of the statues that they dropped their tools and fled. These faces have been locked in a gaze toward the future for 3,000 years. Their solemn expressions have been thought to show their confidence in immortality because they were connected to the pharaoh. The woman Norfred is identified as a princess in addition to the title of high priest, Rahotep's statue is inscribed, King's Son of His Body. This has led scholars to speculate that this figure may well depict the son of the pharaoh Snefru. Snefru himself was destined to be buried in his masterpiece, the Red Pyramid. Inside, a magnificent hallway passage opens to a burial chamber with ceilings that stretch 45 feet high and appear to be held in place by beams made of stone. Though long ago emptied by tomb robbers, the chamber would have held unimaginable riches and ultimately its royal occupant, the pharaoh's corpse. Here, the dead pharaoh was thought to gaze through the shaft to watch day turn into night. Sealed in a stone tomb, a body would quickly decompose from moisture. The ancient Egyptians realized they were actually destroying what they were hoping to protect. And so, upon Snefru's death, he would become something else. It was during the fourth dynasty in ancient Egypt that the pharaohs undertook the most ambitious building projects ever attempted before now. The first to build here was the pharaoh Khufu. He succeeded his father, Snefru, in the year 2551 BC. Snefru had built the bent and red pyramids at Dashur. Now, Khufu would build on his father's achievements, erecting the largest pyramid on the Giza Plateau. Khufu the builder of the Great Pyramid inherited an already very stable, centralized, uh, and powerful kingdom. Uh, and although we're very impressed by the Great Pyramid, uh, it's important to remember that his father had already had two pyramids built, also massive monuments in stone, which if you took them together would easily outweigh the scale of the Great Pyramid. So we're very impressed by what Khufu achieved, but in many ways he was just continuing a tradition that was already established before him. Rising some 480 feet high, the Pyramid of Khufu is taller than the Statue of Liberty, St. Peter's Cathedral, or an Apollo spacecraft on its launching pad. In fact, it was the tallest structure on Earth until the Eiffel Tower was built in 1889. It was meant to be seen from everywhere. 
The site that he chose was very important because it's on a rise. It's a plateau and it's on a rise. And so his monument could be seen um, throughout the whole northern part of the country. So wherever you were uh, around the capital, you could see the monument that was being built. The Great Pyramid is constructed of individual stones that weigh an average of two and a half tons each. The immense structure contains more than 2,300,000 of these stones, all placed in such seemingly perfect order that it is almost impossible not to think that this was somehow the building project of gods. Inside, a chamber known as the Grand Gallery was built near the top. It is a red granite room, the final resting place for the pharaoh. At the far end of the chamber is the red granite sarcophagus of the pharaoh Khufu, for whom the Great Pyramid was built. The term sarcophagus comes to us from the Greek word sarx, which means flesh, and phagin, to eat. Combined together as sarcophagus, this gruesome word describes these ancient stone coffins as flesh-eating boxes. How the Egyptians quarried, shaped, and moved so much stone to the Giza Plateau has baffled scholars for centuries. They had no beasts of burden or wheels strong enough to carry the weight. By this achievement, his pyramid transformed Khufu into the very symbol of absolute rule, and the fifth century Greek historian Herodotus chronicled the pharaoh's extreme cruelty. Khufu drove them into the extremity of misery. For first, he shut up all the temples to debar them from sacrificing in them. And thereafter, he ordered all Egyptians to work for himself. To some, was assigned the dragging of great stones from the stone quarries in the Arabian mountains as far as the Nile. The people worked in gangs of 100,000 for each a period of three months. The pyramid itself took 20 years in the building. But to such a pitch of wickedness did Khufu come that when in need of money, he sent his own daughter to take her place in a brothel. Modern-day scholars are skeptical that Khufu was truly an evil king. The notion that Khufu was a harsh ruler seems to have originated in a um, text that dates to a much, much later period in which he is seen as sort of a bored or even an indifferent ruler, not to say necessarily harsh. That idea was picked up by the later Greek historians, and we are told that he was truly a tyrant but really there is no contemporary evidence. In fact, there is little written history at all describing the builder of the Great Pyramid, and aside from a granite head thought to depict him, only a tiny statuette of him carved in ivory has survived to the present. Outside his pyramid at Giza, a large burial field was recently excavated that suggests that the bodies buried here were the workers whose back-breaking labor built Khufu's Great Pyramid. Had the workers been slaves, Khufu would not have honored them with burial so close to himself. What is known is that not only had pyramid building practices evolved to a high standard here at the beginning of the fourth dynasty, the practice of embalming had grown into an arcane and mystical art that transformed a corpse into a mummy. Beginning about the time of Khufu's father, Snefru, mummification became essential in Egyptian religion for the dead pharaoh to complete a transformation from earthly ruler to heavenly king. They believed that by preserving the physical body intact, they could preserve the pharaoh's spirit forever. An elaborate ritual of embalming was designed to save the corpse from decomposition and restore its faculties so that it could live in a well-equipped tomb. The preservation of bodies through mummification 
allows us to gaze upon the faces of pharaohs and others whose bodies were preserved over 4,000 years ago. It also allows us to see firsthand just how mortal the god kings really were. Through medical analysis, modern doctors know that the pharaohs suffered from gallstones, tuberculosis, polio, appendicitis, hernias, club feet, and cholera. Outside Khufu's pyramid were found these pits in which mysterious pieces of cedar wood native only to Lebanon were found. Archaeologists were able to remove and then reassemble all the fragments. The result was a 143-foot boat that could actually float upon water. The boat was probably provided by Khufu's successor in 2528 BC. This was his son, Jedefre. It was he who presided over his father's burial at Giza. His name, Jedefre, meant enduring like Ray, a reference to their god of the sun. Jedefre's main significance was that he was the first pharaoh to adopt such a sun name. The pharaoh Jedefre ruled only 10 years before he was succeeded by his brother, Khafre in 2520 BC. Khafre, whose name meant appearing like Ray, the sun god, immediately began construction of the second pyramid here on the Giza Plateau. This pyramid was for himself and built in the shadow of his father's great pyramid. The best evidence points to the fact that this work continued throughout his reign of 30 years. During the reign of Khafra, the Egyptians certainly seem to have been very prosperous, prosperous as they were under his predecessors, although some people have suggested that the drain on the economy and the, the, the national population of building these great pyramids was so huge that impoverishment started to set in at about that time. Indeed, there were signs that Khafra's rise to power marked a turning point for the fourth dynasty, a succession of kings that had begun nearly 600 years before. Still, Khafre built on, adding an elaborate mortuary temple complete with a magnificent, life-size statue of himself protected by the hawk god Horus. But perhaps the foremost symbol of Khafre's reign towers on the eastern base of the Giza Plateau, in the shadow of his pyramid, the Great Sphinx. The Egyptians revered these mythical beasts as the guardians of sacred places. Khafre's workers shaped the stone here into a lion and gave it their king's face over 4,500 years ago. This is the oldest known royal portrait in such large scale. Its ears are more than 12 feet tall and its eyes are six feet high. Its body measures 240 feet more than three quarters the length of a football field. Its head rises to 66 feet in height, the equivalent of a six-story building. The name Sphinx, which means strangler, was given by the Greeks when they first encountered this fabulous stone creature. The Sphinx itself may have been formed out of the bedrock that was left in that area when that, uh, that was actually an area of quarrying. And some of the basic stones for the core of the pyramid probably came from that area. In fact, scholars tell us that the Great Sphinx was probably carved out of the stone left over from the Pyramid of Khafre. But its ultimate purpose remains unknown. Still crouching in front of his pyramid complex, alone in the silence of the desert, the stony stare of the Sphinx provides challenges but offers no clear answers. As if to yield a clue, its time-scarred, weather-beaten face looks out upon the plain and fronts the setting sun. History would one day reveal that the sun indeed was setting upon the dynasty of pharaohs that built the pyramids and great Sphinx of Giza.
Sand. Desert. Wind. Water. The Pharaohs. Out of the cradle of civilization came men and women whom thousands worshipped as gods on Earth. They led their people through an era that brought human creativity, mysticism, and intellect together to form one of the greatest cultures the world has ever seen. For 3,000 years, they ruled ancient Egypt and built great monuments to themselves and to their gods. The pyramids of Giza, the Great Sphinx, the temples of Abydos, Karnak, and Luxor, the pharaohs. Through eyes carved in stone, they gaze out into the future. Their faces locked in expressions that convey a powerful legacy to all who look upon them. Their bodies wrapped in linen have traveled forward through time, and their spirits are reflected in countless sculptures, paintings, and hieroglyphs. Now the story of this ancient race of god kings continues. Find out who this pharaoh really was and why he was thought to be a heretic. Learn the story of the pharaoh Cleopatra, who was also a seductress, and how she met her tragic end. Gaze upon the face of the pharaoh who built the most elaborate temples the world has ever seen. Walk among the men and women of Egypt who were the greatest pharaohs. Egypt, a land where desolation and endless desert give way to a narrow strip where water flows and life took hold. From these beginnings sprang the wonders of a flourishing Egyptian civilization that would last for more than 3,000 years. By the year 1386 BC, the Egyptian civilization was 2,000 years old and had been ruled by 86 pharaohs. It was in this year that a young and vigorous king by the name of Amenhotep III emerged to become ruler. By the reign of the pharaoh Amenhotep III, the Egyptian empire was very well established. There was a tremendous inflow of income, uh, especially for the royal house. And Egypt itself was very stable and prosperous. And so with Amenhotep III, you get the appearance of a really grandiose kind of material culture in Egypt with huge temples, huge royal figures. His vast building projects were centered in the ancient city of Thebes. It was here that the pharaoh Amenhotep III embellished a magnificent temple dedicated to the god Amun, the Egyptian lord of creation. It signaled a peak of craftsmanship and artistic achievement for the Egyptian civilization. Its graceful columns and expansive court remain the pharaoh's masterpiece of elegance and design. On the west bank of the Nile River stand two imposing statues of Amenhotep III, known as the Colossi of Memnon. The 60-foot-high monuments are all that is left of the pharaoh's mortuary temple that once stood here. Standing beside him, dwarfed by his stature, is the image of Queen T, who was his wife and the mother of his son. From trading expeditions abroad and an abundant supply of gold from the mines of Nubia, Egypt under Amenhotep III enjoyed a time of wealth and great prosperity. The Egyptians have the leisure to start getting involved in a lot of theological speculation, uh, which leads to what the Egyptians considered a disaster. The disaster came in 1353 BC and took the form of a strangely shaped man who some believe was a heretic. The 
Pharaoh Amenhotep III had been grooming his oldest son for the throne when the young prince died. This left his younger brother, Amenhotep IV, to succeed their father. He had been studying religious matters, however, not affairs of state. As a result, his reign was a revolutionary departure from the long entrenched traditions of Egyptian kingship. Scholars still struggle to understand this pharaoh. Was he a fanatic or a great reformer, a visionary or a madman? Whatever the answers, he was without question the strangest of all the pharaohs. For over 1,700 years, the Egypt of the pharaohs had worshipped many gods. Amenhotep IV wanted Egypt to follow only one god, the sun god called Aten. As if to complete the transformation of Egyptian religion, the pharaoh changed his name from Amenhotep to Akhenaten, which meant servant of the sun god Aten. It was the first time in history that mankind worshipped a single god. This radical change rocked Egypt to the very clay of its ancient foundations. Akhenaten's reign was one of the great crisis points of Egyptian history. It was a period during which the old beliefs were overturned, the capital was moved, and the temples and cults were essentially shut down. This can't have been easy for the population. The massive temple complex of Karnak at the ancient capital of Thebes remains the largest religious site in the world. It was here in 1350 BC that Akhenaten was crowned pharaoh in a traditional ceremony. But then tradition ended, great changes were on the horizon. They began with the pharaoh Akhenaten's expansion and beautification of the Temple of the Sun at Karnak. Most notably, he added a new symbol to the temple. This curious disc was called the Aten. It was designed to symbolize his new god of the sun. In year five of his rule, Akhenaten proclaimed the Aten Egypt's one and only god. Akhenaten has occasionally been called history's first monotheist, in that he did away, or at least no longer funded, the worship of all the other gods in favor of only one, the Aten, or the physical disk of the sun. His choice for queen was also unconventional. Her name was Nefertiti, she came from a non-royal bloodline, but appeared to hold a very prominent position in her husband's reign. One of the most magnificent pieces of sculpture ever unearthed in Egypt is a limestone bust of Akhenaten's legendary queen. Nefertiti appears to have been an exquisite queen, but when we examine images of Akhenaten, we discover that his appearance was as bizarre as his ideas. Early on, many representations of Akhenaten caused a great deal of confusion among archaeologists. Because he was often portrayed with wide hips, a protruding belly, and breasts, he was sometimes mistaken for a woman who may have been masquerading as a man. It seems possible. Years earlier, Queen Hatshepsut was often portrayed as a male. She even went as far as to wear the false beard reserved for kings, perhaps to appear more like a pharaoh. Akhenaten's physique has sometimes been attributed to an illness called Froelich's syndrome, which causes the body to distribute fat in ways that are considered typically female. One of the side effects of the disease is that you are sterile, and we do know that Akhenaten and Nefertiti had uh, several daughters, and there is some speculation, obviously, that uh, Tutankhamun was a son of his as well. Uh, so if uh, that's the case, then the idea of this one type of disease probably 
is not likely. But Akhenaten's mummy has never been found. All attempts to diagnose his abnormal appearance have been based solely on art and statues. Other scholarly opinions about Akhenaten's startling appearance look not to medicine for explanation, but to the symbolism tied to his new religion that was based on the Aten sun god. Akhenaten's new religion was a radical departure for Egypt, but so strong was his conviction that he was willing to defy and eliminate the powerful religious institutions which represented the beliefs of virtually the entire population. He shut down the temples of the god Amun and declared Thebes would no longer be the foremost city of Egypt. A new capital city dedicated solely to his religion would be built. The pharaoh called his new city Akhetaten, which meant the horizon of the sun god. At the center of the new capital was the great temple. It was there that the pharaoh Akhenaten cultivated his new religion, devoted to the adoration of the sun god he called Aten. Before Akhenaten's religious reformation, ordinary people worshipped outside the temples, while the king, priests, and the elite of society performed their rites inside mysterious secret chambers. Akhenaten changed all that. He wanted the people to worship along with their pharaoh, out in the open under the sun's life-giving rays. It is believed that three ceremonies a day were held at the great Aten temple. The first was at dawn, as the sun rose over the cliffs east of the city. A second ceremony was held at noon, when the sun was directly overhead. Then, at sunset, the devoted would recite a hymn to the sun, which Akhenaten himself had composed. It is not known how successful Akhenaten was in converting his subjects to belief in the Aten. It is possible his new religion was simply a ploy to strengthen his image as a pharaoh. By eliminating other gods, Akhenaten knew he would appear more like a god himself. The king was removing the intermediaries, the clutter of all the intermediate priests, the uh, very bulky and cumbersome pantheon with hundreds of different deities and so forth, with a simpler form of the religion. But it was mainly involved with the idea of the king creating a more direct support for the idea of him as a living divinity here on the earth. Akhenaten did not conduct this worship alone. There is evidence that his queen, Nefertiti, led the sunset ceremony each day. Nefertiti was a very important woman. We're not quite sure whether it was Akhenaten who, who granted her some of the importance that she had, uh, or whether she just decided to take it. There are some scholars who felt all along that Nefertiti was behind the religious revolution even more than her husband. Another powerful woman of this era was Akhenaten's mother. Her name was Queen T. She had migrated with her son to his new city to act as his regent. Because Akhenaten was absorbed with matters of religion, it appears Queen T may have been responsible for affairs of state. If so, there remains a puzzling archive of clay tablets that were sent to the pharaoh Akhenaten. They came from outposts of the Egyptian empire in Syria. The tablets reported that the outposts were under attack and failing. These writings, known as the Armana letters, pleaded for supplies to be sent and promised continued loyalty in exchange. It is likely earlier pharaohs would have responded with soldiers and strategy. In this case, however, it seems Queen T may have been the one who ignored these pleas for help. Art from this period also underwent a radical change. Everywhere the pharaoh's image appeared, 
he was shown to be under the protection of the sun's rays. While previous pharaohs were depicted as being physically perfect, Akhenaten instructed the royal artisans to picture him more realistically. Instead of looking like a warrior, his statues portrayed him as feminine. And he was seen being tender with his children or in poses with Nefertiti that would have seemed far too intimate just a few years before. Akhenaten and Nefertiti ruled together for 12 years and then, curiously, there is no record of the queen after that. The disappearance of Nefertiti is one of the great mysteries of Akhenaten's reign. After being such an integral part of her husband's kingship, almost a co-regent, suddenly there are no more mentions or depictions of her to be found. The reasons for this are still in debate. Some believe she may have died during childbirth. At one time, it was believed she was indiscreet in some way and Akhenaten disposed of her. Still, others suggest that she lived on past Akhenaten's interest in the sun. Nefertiti could have, in fact, been the more devout of the two and cloistered herself away to remain loyal to the cult of the Aten. But the, the general, the basic situation seems to be that she actually died. And there is evidence that she was buried in the royal tomb at Amarna, in the, what is called the royal wadi, beyond the confines of the royal city. In any case, Akhenaten did not have to suffer from a lack of companionship. He appointed a new male co-ruler. His name was Smenkara and some believe he may have been the pharaoh's younger brother. It is possible that he married one or more of his daughters. If he did that, that would not actually be unusual for a pharaoh. But in the case of uh, Akhenaten, we also have a suggestion uh, that he had a homosexual relationship with uh, his co-ruler, Smenkara, towards the end of his uh, reign. Uh, which would make uh, Akhenaten one of the first bisexual people, presumably, since he also has children from Nefertiti. His unorthodox appearance and descent from the old religion caused history to label him a heretic. Still, there is little evidence that the pharaoh Akhenaten's new sun cult ever really took hold among ordinary people. Excavations of the ancient city of Akhetaten have revealed that even before his death, many of the inhabitants kept idols of the old gods in their homes. Were they ignoring the new religion or did they sense the inevitable? Akhenaten's religion was failing. Akhenaten died in 1334 BC during the 17th year of his reign and with him died his religion based on the worship of the sun disk. Soon after, there was a tremendous backlash against his religion and heresy, which led to the destruction of anything that bore his name. It is believed, however, that in order to protect his remains, Akhenaten's followers removed his body from its tomb at Amarna. It was an Egyptian custom to uh, gather together and to try to hide and conceal and protect for, for, for the future. Uh, the remains of important pharaohs and burials. And I think there's a strong possibility that that's what did happen and that it remains to be discovered for archaeologists in the future. With the heretic Akhenaten dead, Egypt prayed for a strong pharaoh to restore its faith and reassure its people. Instead, this burden fell upon a boy just 10 years old. Behind the great cliffs of Dar el Bahari, in the mountains west of Thebes, lies a golden landscape formed in primordial times, when floodwaters from the Nile cut through the earth, leaving a series of gullies and dry stream beds called wadis. It is within these canyons, in a place known as the Valley of the Kings, 
that the Egyptians of the New Kingdom buried their departed pharaohs. It was here on a balmy afternoon in 1922 AD that a modern day discovery saved the legacy of a minor pharaoh from being lost in the sands of time. From evidence recovered, it was learned that this king named Tutankhamun was the son of the heretic pharaoh Akhenaten. This may explain why so little was known of Tutankhamun before this finding. When the Egyptians tried to erase the memory of Akhenaten, they may have also tried to erase the memory of his son. The list of kings inscribed on the walls at Abydos curiously omits Tutankhamun's name along with Akhenaten's. This has led scholars to ponder the question, who was the pharaoh Tutankhamun? He was born and raised in Akhenaten's capital city at Amarna. His birth name was Tut Ankh Aten, which meant living image of the sun god. But with the death of his father, the old religious beliefs and the cult of Amun were reinstated. Accordingly, he removed the Aten from the end of his name and replaced it with Amun to become the legendary boy king Tutankhamun. His new name meant image of the god of life, Artifacts exist which depict him as a robust king attacking Nubian and Syrian enemies. But experts believe it's unlikely that young Tutankhamun was ever actually involved in any military campaigns. Such responsibilities were probably handled by an experienced general named Horemheb. He was an ambitious warrior. Inscriptions identify him as commander-in-chief of the army and deputy of the king. Horam Heb had served as military commander for the two pharaohs that preceded Tutankhamun. It was his mission to reassert Egypt's military might and restore respect from its neighbors. Were there others in this boy king's court that also wielded great power? It seems that a boy suddenly thrust upon the throne of a great empire would need senior officials for advice and guidance. The question is, was Tutankhamun just a puppet for the real power behind the throne? Perhaps the answer lies with a member of King Tutankhamun's court who overshadows everyone else. He was the king's vizier and high priest called I. A skilled and determined civil servant, his name meant Divine Father. Scholars believe it is I, along with Horemheb, who were responsible for the stability of Egypt during this time. Horemheb and I, between them, are adherents to the ancient god Amun. It is they, principally, who discard this new religion of the Aten, and the court and the religious focus is moved back to ancient um, Thebes, modern Luxor. Although, of course, naturally, all the inscriptions extol the virtues of Tutankhamun, but, of course, it's the bureaucrats, the civil servants, the general, Horemheb, the high priest I, who are essentially running the country, rubber-stamping everything. To what extent any pharaoh was involved in the day-to-day -day business of foreign and domestic affairs still puzzles experts. Egypt had a fully developed bureaucracy of administrators and scribes. The pharaoh was a figurehead, both royal and religious. Tutankhamun, like the other kings before him, had much of his life orchestrated around certain routines and ceremonies designed to reinforce his stature. The king, as a person, is hedged around with royal symbolism. Um, he has people watching him from the moment he gets up to the time he goes to bed. So to a great extent, his life is simply circumscribed by that. You might have found state affairs, in fact, quite onerous, putting on those heavy crowns and, and all that regalia 
and look forward to the time that he could simply take them off and uh, go off and play with his friends. Tutankhamun had a queen. She was two years older than he was. It appears Akhenaten was the father of both. This made the pharaoh's bride also his half-sister. Her name was Ankhus and Pa'aten. We do know that she was very important to him. They were married when they were fairly young. From the representations, we see that she sits nearby him. Uh, she seems to take an active interest in some of the things that he was doing in hunting and fowling and fishing. With the old religion of many gods now reinstated, the reign of King Tutankhamun seemed destined to be a period of rebirth and renewal for Egypt. But then, at about the age of 20, the young pharaoh suddenly died. Some believe he was murdered. Forensic analysis of his mummy shows that he died of damage to his cranial cavity. This suggests a blow to the head. Further examination reveals a small hole in his skull. Scholars have constructed theories as to how it got there. One is that he was thrown from his chariot, but that seems highly unlikely because of the nature of the damage to the skull. Others, that someone crept upon him in the night and thrust a small pointed object into the brain and therefore did away with him in a silent and stealthy manner. And still others, that he might have died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Was there a conspiracy to murder the pharaoh? Some believe the damage to Tutankhamun's skull didn't occur until after he was dead. It is known for a fact that embalmers were not very careful. And there have been evidences of um, spare legs that are in coffins. And in some cases, um, in order to make sure that a, an individual fit into the coffin, then the toes were cut off. Uh, in Tutankhamun's case, it's also clear that the embalmers were not very careful. So my guess is that the uh, damage that was done to the skull was probably uh, the embalmer's fault and not a cause of death. The short reign and sudden death of the young king did not allow enough time to finish a proper royal tomb. This is probably the reason that his burial site ended up hidden from plunderers through the ages. The entrance had been obscured by rock chips dumped during the cutting of a later king's tomb. The treasures found in Tutankhamun's tomb have awed the modern world. Up until their discovery, men could only imagine how Egypt's once brilliantly colored temples and artifacts would have appeared in ancient times. The contents of the young pharaoh's tomb reveal the true opulence and splendor of the era. But were the riches chosen to accompany this relatively minor ruler into eternity only a hint of what had been buried in the tombs of the truly great pharaohs? Some historians have suggested that we should not assume the larger tombs were filled with even more treasure. The pharaoh Tutankhamun's burial may have been richer than most. The people may have been grateful to him for the restoration of the old religion. Or there might have been an emotional outpouring for someone that died so young. The untimely passing of the king not only caught the royal tomb builders unprepared, but it left Egypt once again without an heir to the throne. Sadly, there is evidence the young royal couple tried to perpetuate their bloodline. Two mummified fetuses were found in Tutankhamun's tomb that are almost certainly the remains of stillborn daughters. Although it is only a theory, some experts speculate that inbreeding may have been one of the many factors including disease, politics, and warfare, which contributed to the decline of other kingdoms. In Tutankhamun's case, inbreeding may have rendered his children too frail to survive.
With no heir in line to inherit the kingship, the throne was passed to I, Tutankhamun's closest advisor or vizier. Records show that right after he died, I prepared to marry Tutankhamun's young widow to help justify his assumption of the throne. There is evidence that she suspected I was responsible for her husband's death and tried to avoid this marriage. Desperate, the widow Ankes Enamun sought help from outside of Egypt. She turned to a land in the east controlled by the Hittites and wrote to their king. Send me one of your sons. You have many that I may marry one, and he shall become king, for I have none here whom I may marry. He did send one of his sons to be married to Ankes and Amun and become pharaoh of Egypt. But consider the bureaucrats. Horemheb was the general in charge of the army. I was the chief high priest. Curiously enough, the Hittite prince got as far as the borders of Egypt and he was murdered. I married Tutankhamun's widow in 1325 BC and became pharaoh before the deceased king's burial had been even completed. We know this from a painting in Tutankhamun's tomb. It depicts I already wearing a king's blue crown while he performs a ceremony during Tutankhamun's burial. Of course, it is possible that I was just the logical choice to assume the throne after young Tutankhamun died heirless. But there is one more suspicious aspect in the archaeological record from this time. Right after I ascends to the throne, there is no more mention of the young queen, Akasenamun. She disappears. Was she the next victim in this 3,000-year-old conspiracy? I reigned for only four years, and like Tutankhamun, had no heirs to carry on the 18th dynasty. Soon the throne of Egypt would belong to a new dynamic bloodline of kings. Among them would be the greatest of the pharaohs. He would usher in a period of building and expansion never to be equaled, and he would take the image of the pharaoh as a god to the extreme. The city of ancient Thebes. The pharaohs of Egypt were drawn to this landscape that lay along the banks of the Nile River. Queen Hatshepsut had embellished it with an obelisk that bore her name. Amenhotep III had built a grand temple to its patron god, Amun. Thebes' southern location was a natural choice for the capital city of a country that was expanding downward toward the rich territory of Nubia. The pharaoh Tutankhamun had moved the royal court back here before he died, and his vizier, Ai, had remained at Thebes during his brief reign. In 1321 BC, the general called Horemheb proclaimed himself to be the pharaoh of Upper and Lower Egypt. His name meant Horus in jubilation. Horus is Egypt's hawk-headed deity, a bird of prey, the god of the kings. Horemheb came to the throne after a long and distinguished military career which began four administrations earlier, when Amenhotep III was king. He was later appointed the great commander of the army by Akhenaten, and under King Tutankhamun, he was given the title of the king's deputy. Little is known about Horemheb's heritage. He was not from a royal bloodline and therefore had no claim to the throne. He remedied that by marrying Nefertiti's sister, thus creating a feeble link to the bloodline of the kings. Already middle-aged, Horemheb immediately set out to restore Egypt to its status prior to Akhenaten's heresy. 
at Thebes, he reopened the temples of Amun, but to avoid a power struggle with the priesthood, he appointed priests from the army. Since he was a military man, he felt they could be trusted. After this, Horam had initiated the destruction of the great temples to the sun disk built in Amarna by Akhenaten. He used the thousands of stone blocks he removed as filler inside the pylons and walls of his new building projects. But his efforts to erase all traces of Akhenaten's reign ended up having an ironic twist almost 3,000 years later. The result is now, of course, many thousands of years later, as uh, archaeologists work to uh, restore and study these monuments, what do they find? They find these thousands of temple blocks that Haram Heb thought he'd buried forever. And uh, since they've been buried all these years, uh, these scenes depicting Akhenaten and his cult are actually much better preserved than any of the scenes which depict Haram Heb. Horam Hemp also usurped many of the statues and monuments of his immediate predecessors. This was done by simply replacing their names with his. Two statues at Karnak are labeled with the name of Horam Heb, but most Egyptologists believe the facial features are similar to Tutankhamun's. While to us, this may seem to be the epitome of egotism, this practice was not uncommon for many of the pharaohs. Egyptians uh, might have not put such a negative spin on it, and they might have uh, considered it more of recycling, but it was also a royal prerogative in a way, because when a king took over, uh, he became divine, and therefore, since the office had always existed, then he in that office would always have been around and would always exist. It was a right and a privilege that the reigning monarch had. Horemheb ruled for almost 30 years, but when he died in 1306 BC, he, like Tutankhamun and I, was cursed by not having an heir. To avoid the chaos caused by a fight for succession, Horemheb nominated his trusted vizier for the job. This pharaoh took the name of Ramses. He would begin the 19th dynasty, one of the greatest periods of Egyptian history. Ramses had been a career army officer and was probably in his 50s when he became pharaoh. Ramses planned to continue rebuilding Egypt, but his reign lasted only two years. He did manage to accomplish something his three predecessors had not. Ramses produced a male heir to inherit the throne. Ramses' son was Seti I. He had been the vizier and troop commander during his father's brief reign. After inheriting the throne, Seti gave himself the additional title of repeater of births to signify the beginning of a new era. During his time as pharaoh, Egyptian art and culture flourished. Tremendous building projects were also undertaken. At Karnak, Seti enhanced the building of the great hypostyle hall here in the Temple of Amun. He also began to repair and augment the religious sites at Abydos. These efforts helped him to legitimize his non-royal bloodline's claim to the throne. Abydos was the ancient center dedicated to the cult of Osiris, the god of the dead. It was originally built in the old kingdom and had since fallen into disrepair. The temple Seti the first built for himself at Abydos is considered one of the masterworks of the era. Inside, his likeness is depicted alongside many of the gods of Egypt, it is believed that the gods actually dwelled within the temples which were dedicated to them. The wall reliefs here are considered some of Egypt's finest, 
They were carved with great precision and in the more difficult raised technique instead of the more common and quicker inscribed carvings. Seti was also the pharaoh who had the list of kings inscribed in his temple at Abydos. It not only honored those who came before him, but also elevated Seti into their ranks. The name Seti means he of the god Seth. Seth was the deity of storms and war. Seti lived up to his name on the battlefield. He has grown up with the army. He's, it's a totally different attitude to life and certainly to royalty and the higher echelons. He fights incredible campaigns year after year against the Syrians. Amongst his great foundations was, in fact, the temple at Karnak. And on the north wall, you find these incredibly long and huge reliefs of Seti attacking fortresses, destroying the enemies of Egypt. He's a mighty warrior. In 1278 BC, Seti I died after reigning for an extremely productive 13 years. He was originally buried in a tomb prepared for him in the Valley of the Kings. But to protect Seti's remains from grave robbers, his mummy was later removed and taken to a hiding place, dug high into the cliffs above Queen Hatshepsut's temple at Dar el Bahari. Slightly over 100 years ago, in 1881, archaeologists unearthed this tomb. It revealed a remarkable collection of over 160 mummies known as the Royal Cache. Seti I was among the pharaohs discovered. His is the finest example of all the existing royal mummies. During his lifetime, Seti's primary queen was a woman named Tuya. Like her husband, she was from a non-royal family with a military background. Their first son died, their second child was a daughter, but their third child was a boy destined to become Egypt's most celebrated ruler. The dog star Sirius is the brightest in the Egyptian heavens. Each year, it disappears around the beginning of May to reappear about the 18th of July. To the ancient Egyptians, its return signaled the new year and the time for the annual Nile floods that would leave behind a new layer of fertile soil. One year during Seti's reign, the floods were particularly high. Egyptian legend told that this was the good omen that announced the coming of the next ruler of Egypt. This was Ramses II. Ramses II has become the name that is almost synonymous with Pharaoh but it may have been Seti's careful preparation of his son, the crown prince, which really predestined Ramses' success. Ramses II was probably one of the best prepared pharaohs in Egypt, because by the time that he came to the throne, they really uh, had a fairly regular process of making sure that all the senior royal princes uh, had a lot of experience in military affairs, in governance. So when they came to the throne, they were already uh, experienced and effective in what a pharaoh needed to be. By the age of 15, Ramses was already accompanying his father on military campaigns. By 22, he led his first command to put down a small revolt in Nubia. He also ambushed Mediterranean pirates who were searching for plunder along the mouth of the Nile. By the time Seti I's reign was coming to an end, his son had already proven himself as a military leader and worthy of kingship. Possessed with unmatched vision and self-confidence, the future king was poised to leave his indelible mark on the history of Egypt.
sunrise in the modern month of June, 1279 BC. This was the day that a dynamic young prince, 25 years old, was crowned Pharaoh of Egypt. This was Ramses II. It was the beginning of an extraordinary time for this ancient land. During his long reign, which spanned some 67 years, everything was accomplished on a grand scale. No other pharaoh constructed as many temples and monuments as he did. No other pharaoh fathered more children. So inspiring was the reign of Ramses II that the kings that followed in his footsteps called him the great ancestor. But history recalls this pharaoh as Ramses the Great. When Ramses II came to the throne, he was prepared for kingship as perhaps no other prince before him. His father, Seti I, had commanded victorious military campaigns and guided Egypt through a period that was unsurpassed in building and art. He was determined that his son would possess the education and military skills to ensure these traditions would continue once he had become pharaoh. As a boy, Prince Ramses rode alongside his experienced father in military campaigns in Libya and Syria. And because the hope of the new dynasty rested with him, the importance of producing heirs to perpetuate the royal family line was also impressed upon the prince. This was a royal task Ramses took on with a passion. It has been estimated that even before he became pharaoh, his two principal wives in the royal harem had already bore him more than 20 children. Egyptians married young. And so royal princes, before they came to the throne, would probably be married more or less as soon as it was feasible. And the idea would be that they would start producing children very soon. And there's really two reasons for that. One is, you know, it's no good having one prince. That prince simply may not survive long enough to become the next ruler, so you've got to have a number. But the other thing is, the royal house was a kind of image of fertility and productivity for the Egyptians. And so pharaohs and princes tried to produce a lot of children. Ramses recounted the details of his early life in an inscription at his father's temple at Abydos. The all-powerful Seti himself made me great while I was a child. He equipped me with women, a royal harem, and placed those of the north and the south under my feet. At the rock quarry of Aswan, Ramses had supervised the cutting of stone required to build his father's temples. Now that he was pharaoh, Ramses wasted no time in using the lessons he had learned then to erect monuments of his own. Ramses II was probably the first great master builder of the world, and he really built more probably than almost any other monarch in ancient history. In the southern frontier of the country, we have the temple at Luxor, which is a state temple to the god Amun, and he is the major builder in that temple. It was here, at the temple of Luxor, that a huge festival was mounted in his honor two months after his coronation. As a symbol of his gratitude, he commissioned a new gateway, obelisks, and the first of many colossal statues of himself. This is the uh, upper part of an enormous statue of Ramses II that comes from a temple that he built at uh, Abydos in southern Egypt. This is a very fine example of the traditional representation of the pharaoh in ancient Egypt as a kind of uh, powerful adult male. And in this case, because the statue had been buried in the desert sand, it still retains a lot of its color and shows us how brightly colored Egyptian statuary and temples 
were, so that they really looked more like living entities than simply just stone-carved images. Under Ramses, the so-called hypostyle hall, started by Amenhotep III at the Temple of Karnak, was expanded and completed. Like all of the building projects of Ramses the Great, it is a marvel of ancient architecture. Its 134 columns form a veritable forest of stone, which once raised a ceiling to a height of 75 feet. But the building projects of Ramses II did not stop with the temples of Karnak and Luxor, which are located on the east bank of the Nile, at Thebes. In accordance with Egyptian religious dictates, Ramses erected his mortuary temple on the side of the river where the sun sets, along the west bank. It was called the Ramesseum. It was a massive complex. Its construction required the labor of 3,000 stone cutters. Although today much of it lies in ruin, an ancient traveler, Diodorus of Sicily, described it as surpassing all other temples of its time. To protect his temple, two 60-foot high granite statues of the pharaoh once stood here. The remains of one statue's upper torso and head still guards the site today. But it was at Egypt's southern border near modern Sudan that the pharaoh Ramses' grandest monument to himself is found. It dominates the landscape along the Nile and is called the Temple of Abu Simbul. Carved out of the side of a mountain, the grandeur of this great temple must have led ancient river travelers to believe they truly had entered a land ruled by gods. Experts believe that the construction of Abu Simbel began during the 10th year of Ramses II's reign in 1269 BC and took 13 years to complete. Although it was dedicated to the Egyptian gods Amen-Ra and Putah, the enormous sandstone monument glorified the god King Ramses himself more than anything else. Four colossal likenesses of the pharaoh gaze out across the Nile from a facade that appears to have grown right out of the earth. They are commanding figures that reach a height of 65 feet. If they could stand, these giants would be nearly 100 feet tall. By comparison, religious symbols and representations of his queens, children, and relatives are dwarfed. Abu Simbel is a miracle of engineering. It is oriented so that on only two days of the year, during the spring and fall equinoxes, the rays of the rising sun will pierce the entranceway. The light then makes its way past eight 33-foot high statues of the king portrayed as the god Osiris. Continuing along the 215-foot corridor, the sun's rays finally enter the most secret sanctuary of the temple. Here, the light illuminates the statues of three gods seated within. Not surprisingly, Ramses himself is among them. A fourth god, Ptah, is also represented, but not entirely in the light. Evidently, this is because Ptah is the Lord of Shadows. Adjacent to the site of Abu Simbel, Ramses the Great built a temple to honor his favorite wife, Nefertari. Its rock face features six statues of the king and queen and has been interpreted as an amazing display of the king's affection. This was a great honor to be so closely associated with the pharaoh, and it is likely Queen Nefertari witnessed the dedication of her own temple at Abu Simbel. Nefertari died in 1254 BC, and as the principal wife of the pharaoh, Ramses had a tomb prepared for her in the Valley of the Queens, on the west side of the Nile, near Thebes. 
The tomb lies some 25 feet below ground level. Recently restored and open to the public, it represents one of the most beautiful examples of an ancient Egyptian royal tomb known to exist. Inside, Nefertari is portrayed on the walls in symbolic poses with the gods. Around the same time as the temple of Abu Simbel was being built, Ramses the Great began work on the new city called Perambusu, a name that means Domain of Ramses. Located in the northeast part of the Nile Delta, it has special significance. Hebrews had lived peacefully around the Nile Delta for 400 years, but concerned over their numbers, Ramses and his father before him may have forced them into the hard labor of constructing this new city. It is from here, around the year 1263 BC, that the story of the Exodus in the Bible probably took place. Ramses II is often associated with the Exodus. The details that are given about Egypt at the time, including naming a specific city, fit in with the later New Kingdom and the general period of Ramses II. Um, and we know that there were many, many peoples brought in for various reasons during that time. So I would say that it's basically a true story. It's recorded only in the Bible because it was an extremely important event in history of the Hebrews it would have been a minor event to the Egyptians of the day. Whether or not he was the great pharaoh of the Bible, there is little question that Ramses' vast building projects left no corner of Egypt without a reminder of his omnipotence. By erecting so many monuments to himself, Ramses raised his image to the status of a god. But Ramses the Great's fame was not based solely on the monuments he built. He is also remembered for the enemies he crushed. Ancient Egypt. In a civilization that endured longer than any other, one man stands out among its leaders. He fathered more children and erected more monuments than any other pharaoh. Even his accomplishments on the field of battle remain some of Egypt's most celebrated. During his 67-year reign, Ramses II led foreign conquests that brought a flood of riches into Egypt and spurred a cultural boom. New monuments and additions to temples were paid for with tribute to Ramses and by the spoils of war. The labor was provided by slaves he captured in battle. Northeast of ancient Egypt lay a vast desert frontier that is now modern Syria. Ramses' father, Seti I, had maintained control over the southern coastal regions of this land. However, a people known as the Hittites held sway in the outer areas and in a strategic city called Kadesh. During the fourth year of the reign of Ramses the Great, a revolt took place in the Egyptian-occupied area. Ramses was determined to retain the land his father had won for Egypt and use the opportunity to oust his enemies, the Hittites, from their stronghold once and for all. To accomplish this, Ramses would face his greatest test. It is remembered as the Battle of Kadesh. The ancient inscriptions tell us that in 1275 BC, Ramses assembled one of the greatest forces of Egyptian troops ever seen. He led his army of 20,000 men up the Gaza Strip toward Kadesh. Close to his destination, two Hittite spies were captured, but they misled Ramses by saying the enemy was fearful and 100 miles to the north. Confident 
Ramses moved ahead with only one quarter of his force and then set up camp to wait for the remainder of his army. By the time he learned the formidable Hittites were actually lying in ambush, it was too late. Miraculously, Ramses did manage to hold off the enemy long enough to allow Egyptian reinforcements to arrive. A complete rout was avoided, but most experts believe the Battle of Kadesh ended in stalemate. It is apparent, however, the Pharaoh didn't see it that way. Ramses' tales of his triumphs at Kadesh are inscribed on the walls of the temples at Karnak, Luxor, Abydos, the Ramesseum, and inside Abu Simbul. It is celebrated as one of the greatest military victories in ancient Egyptian history. But did it really happen that way? One of the most interesting sets of historical documents we have from the reign of Ramses II is uh, the series of representations and inscriptions describing uh, the Battle of Kadesh, this great battle uh, in which Ramses portrays himself as defeating uh, the Hittites uh, at the site of Kadesh in uh, Syria. Uh, the actual outcome of the battle, however, appears to have been more of a stalemate, and it's one in which the Egyptians did not come out looking very victorious. Campaigns against the Hittites continued in later years, Ramses finally realized he could not hold the far reaches of Syria. In what some believe is the first peace treaty in history, the two countries agreed in 1259 BC to a non-aggression pact of mutual support. Carved in clay and stone, both Hittite and Egyptian versions of the document survive to this day. Once peace had been secured, Ramses II married a Hittite princess to cement the treaty. His harem eventually grew to include royal ladies from Syria and Babylon. Ramses II died in 1212 BC. Records tell us he was 92 years old. After the mummification process, his body was wrapped in golden shrouds and fine linen, placed in a stone sarcophagus, and entombed near his ancestors in the Valley of the Kings. Despite all the provisions to ensure an everlasting afterlife, over the next 200 years, his burial site was repeatedly plundered by tomb robbers. Priests had to rewrap and move his mummy to other tombs to keep it whole. His final resting place was a simple cedar coffin. In 1881 AD, Ramsey's mummy was found hidden away with the other mummies of the royal cache at Dar el Bahari near Queen Hatshepsut's temple. Analysis of his mummified remains revealed him to have had red hair and a height of about five foot six. His aquiline nose had been well preserved because his embalmer stuffed it with peppercorns. The inability for Ramses to find peace after death was symbolic of what lay ahead for Egypt. The country was beginning a long and fitful decline. It is believed Ramses the Great sired over 200 children, of which more than 100 reached adulthood. The first 12 sons in the line of succession died before their father. The 13th would become Pharaoh. His name was Merneptah. Because his father had reached the astounding age of 92, Merneptah was in his 60s by the time he became ruler. Although he did wage successful military campaigns against the Libyans and Nubians, his 10-year reign was too short for him to equal Ramsey's achievements. Still, the discovery of a portion of Meneptah's palace at Memphis was a great archaeological find. 
no other remains of a pharaoh's residence have ever been unearthed. Pieces from the complex and a scale model of a section of the ancient residence can be seen at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology. They reveal the grace and beauty of the colorful surroundings that the great Egyptian rulers called home. The incised carvings on these actual fragments from the palace depict the pharaoh in symbolic royal poses. On this fragment, uh, we have depicted uh, Merneptah standing in front of the creator god, Atum, this figure on the right. And Atum is conferring the crook and flail, the symbols of kingship, upon Merneptah, who's represented here with the Atef crown and holding this Rechyet bird, a lapwing bird, which symbolizes the people of Egypt. Hieroglyphic inscriptions on the palace gateway describe accompanying scenes depicting Merneptah's link to the gods and power as pharaoh. The text reads, granting to you the crook and flail and millions of years of rule. Uh, so this is a very condensed and very nice statement on the uh, divine interaction of the king and the way uh, his kingship was conferred upon him uh, by the gods. The glorious high water marks of the 19th dynasty pharaohs were history by the time Merneptah died in 1202 BC. But the story of the greatest pharaohs did not end there. Before it would draw to a close, the name Ramses was heard across nations and represented the might of Egypt one more time. And a queen called Cleopatra became the center of a drama that captivated the world. Below the foothills of the mountains which conceal the Valley of the Kings stands a mortuary temple at a site called Medinet Habu. It is the best preserved of all the temples at the ancient city of Thebes and the only one in Egypt where the existing hieroglyphs, reliefs, and architectural layout have been completely documented and translated. Its builder was Ramses III, the second pharaoh of the 20th dynasty, who took power in the year 1182 BC. His connection to Ramses the Great was in name only. They did not descend from the same bloodline. Ramses III inherited a stable Egypt, a nation at relative peace. But eight years into his reign, he would be compelled to face an enemy that would put his world in turmoil. Around the year 1176 BC, the ancient nations along the eastern Mediterranean, in areas known today as Turkey, Syria, and Israel, were threatened by a wave of humanity, armed and aggressive. These invaders were collectively and curiously known as the Sea Peoples. During the reign of Ramses III, um, from his mortuary temple at uh, Medina Tabu, we have one of the longest historical texts from pharaonic history, which is the depiction of the, the invasion and defeat of the Sea Peoples. This invasion appears to have been not only a sea invasion, but also to have taken place on land. The Sea Peoples were not just armies. They were nations on the move, including women and children seeking lands to settle. The gravity of the threat to Egypt was magnified by the fact the Sea Peoples were even able to overrun Egypt's traditionally powerful rivals, the Hittites. Ramses III realized the urgency of his situation. He ordered his outposts to stand firm at all costs while he rapidly mobilized and marched an army northeast to turn back the invaders. The first of two battles with the Sea Peoples took place on land near the Syrian border of Egypt. Ramses' victory was decisive, but he still had to confront their navy. Evidence suggests the navy of the Sea Peoples was formidable. 
Still, paintings on the walls of Ramses' temples depict his archers bravely firing countless arrows from the shore and from ships into the enemy's ranks. It was clearly a major effort involving a lot of very exotic people with whom the Egyptians were not very familiar in terms of their military organization or their fighting capabilities. So it was really one of the great military success stories of, of ancient Egypt. Despite his glorious victory, Ramses III was forced to put down yet another invasion three years later. This time, it was staged on Egypt's western border by an alliance of different tribes, including the Libyans. After winning the battles here, scribes proceeded to count the enemy dead. This was accomplished by cutting off their right hands, which were brought before the pharaoh and tallied. In one case, Ramses III ordered a recount. This time, in a gruesome display of spite, the enemy's phalluses were severed. Ramses III had once again saved the nation, but then, in an ironic twist of fate, an assassination attempt was made upon his life. We actually have the records of the official inquiry, which was set up to inquire into his assassination. And there's a certain amount of debate as to whether it was an attempted assassination and he survived, or whether it was successful and this is the aftermath. The instigator of the plot to kill the king was a secondary queen named Tai. Some believe that the motive for the crime was Tai's disappointment that her son would never ascend to the throne. There were simply too many others in line before him. Her plan may have been to kill Ramses so that her side of the family could usurp the normal line of succession and seize control of Egypt. But it seems one of the conspirators had second thoughts and let the secret out. The trials involved more than 40 conspirators. After being found guilty, six of the condemned committed suicide in the court. They died in sight of all those present. Their alternative would have been a slow and painful public death on a sharp impaling rod. Others found guilty of lesser involvement had their ears and noses cut off. Whether or not the assassination attempt was successful, it is certain Ramses died before the verdicts were handed down. The shameful end to his 31-year reign foreshadowed troubled and chaotic times for Egypt. After Ramses III and his successes, you get this period of uh, political breakup and social stress. There are still Egyptian pharaohs, but they seem to be much less in control of the situation. Uh, you have the country itself dividing up into several kingdoms with several pharaohs ruling at the same time. Scholars suggest that Egypt was failing for yet another reason. Egypt is no longer confined to the narrow, safe valley of the Nile. There are other great empires rising, not least, of course, over in Assyria. And we're into the last thousand years BC. So the whole thing is a state of flux. So Egypt is no longer top of the pile, top dog, and she is suffering. Over the next 800 years, nearly 70 rulers from 11 new dynasties would govern Egypt. They included Libyan, Nubian, Syrian, and Persian conquerors. Egypt was under the domination of the Persians when in the year 333 BC, they were compelled to face one of the most formidable military commanders in history, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was the son of King Philip II of Macedonia, who had become the dominant power in Greece at the time. Educated by the Greek philosopher Aristotle, young Alexander rose to power in 336 BC, after his father was assassinated. 
He immediately turned his attention to the task of defeating the Persians who had threatened Greece for over 200 years. The Greeks fought their way southward until finally at the age of 25, Alexander decisively defeated the king of Persia, coercing the king's forces to flee occupied Egypt. Shortly thereafter, Alexander entered Egypt as its liberator. He met no resistance and was promptly crowned pharaoh and became a god. Alexander was a highly intelligent individual. And in no country is his political acumen more concretely displayed than in Egypt. Certainly to his troops, while he was, of course, a king and a great warrior and a great man, he was not a god. However, he and his advisors were intelligent enough to see that if he was going to be able to control Egypt, he would have to assume the mantle of the Egyptian kings and be worshipped as a divinity. Although Alexander was now pharaoh of Egypt, his destiny lay elsewhere. Shortly after founding the city of Alexandria and naming it the capital of Egypt, he continued to conquer foreign lands as far away as India. In 323 BC, however, Alexander, the survivor of many wounds, died of fever in Babylon. His empire, the largest the world had ever seen, was divided amongst his generals. Chief among them was his boyhood friend, Ptolemy. When Ptolemy laid claim to Egypt, it marked the beginning of the last Egyptian dynasty, a dynasty that would found the greatest institution of learning ever seen, build one of the seven wonders of the world, and produce the most famous queen in history. Hidden beneath the harbor of the ancient city of Alexandria, are clues to mysteries that have gone unsolved for over 2,000 years. Rulers of empires once strolled along these paths. Submerged by an earthquake and only recently uncovered, these ruins provide us with a glimpse into the world of ancient Egyptian royalty. Here lie the remains of the palace of Cleopatra. The final chapter in the story of the greatest pharaohs began in the year 323 BC. It was in that year, Alexander the Great's general, Ptolemy I, laid claim to Egypt. Later, he crowned himself pharaoh and became the first king of the 32nd dynasty, the Egyptian dynasty of the Ptolemies. The Ptolemies were a fairly successful line of Egyptian pharaohs in the sense that they maintained a, uh, a prosperous country through most of the period of their rule. Uh, they maintained a traditional religion as well as practicing Greek religion. Uh, there are lots of temples in which the walls are covered with traditional images of Ptolemaic rulers. So it is the last great phase of Egyptian kingship, actually, and it's not an inglorious ending. Like the great pharaohs before them, the Ptolemies were builders. They are best remembered for their monument to learning, the Alexandria Library. Hundreds of thousands of written works were stored there, but it was more than a library. It was the literary and scientific seat of its time. The first place in history where scholars from every corner of the known world and every field of study congregated for the sole purpose of seeking knowledge. The Ptolemies also built the Lighthouse of Alexandria, similar in design to the smaller lighthouse which they also built. It was the last of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The great lighthouse once stood at the site of this citadel and rose 400 feet above the harbor. Its beacon, 
was created by huge fires that were visible to sailors more than 100 miles out to sea. Despite early successes, family rivalries, political strife, and economic decline began to weaken the Ptolemies. Eventually, the ever-increasing power of Rome determined the fortunes of Egypt. By the middle of the last century BC, the Ptolemies were rulers of Egypt in name only. Julius Caesar held the real power over the land of the Nile. In the year 51 BC, Ptolemy XII willed the throne of Egypt to his 18-year-old daughter, the seventh Ptolemy to be named Cleopatra. But she was forced to share the throne equally with her 10-year-old brother, Ptolemy XIII. Cleopatra was born in 69 BC. She spoke seven languages and was the only one of the Greek pharaohs capable of speaking Egyptian. Contrary to popular mythology, Cleopatra was not physically beautiful. It is said, however, that she possessed exceptional intelligence, charm, and a beautiful voice. The great philosopher Plutarch once wrote, it was a delight merely to hear the sound of her voice, with which, like an instrument of many strings, she could pass from one language to another, so that in her interviews with barbarians, she seldom required an interpreter. Cleopatra used and needed all of her talents to maintain control of her beloved Egypt. Not long after taking the throne, Differences between Cleopatra and her brother resulted in outright civil war. Some experts argue that the Alexandria Library was destroyed in the conflict. Cleopatra was forced to flee briefly to Syria, but returned to Alexandria upon hearing that Julius Caesar had arrived there from Rome. She realized with the growing power of Rome in the Mediterranean world that there was very little hope of her maintaining her status as Queen of Egypt. So much so when Julius Caesar came to Egypt, as we all well know from the many plays and scenarios written subsequently, she beguiled him. Wrapped in a carpet, Cleopatra's servants smuggled the queen into Alexandria and carried her up to Caesar's quarters. The carpet was presented as a gift, and when it was rolled out, the queen of Egypt was revealed. Caesar was enchanted, and Cleopatra gained the ally she needed. Defeated, her brother Ptolemy XIII mysteriously drowned. Caesar returned to Rome only weeks later, leaving Cleopatra pregnant with his son, Caesarion. But after a year had passed, he requested her presence. Cleopatra's appearance in Rome was an outrage, and combined with Caesar's feuds with the Roman Senate, led to his assassination in 44 BC. Cleopatra returned to Egypt while the power vacuum left by Caesar's death was being filled by his great-grand-nephew Octavian and one of Caesar's former consuls, Mark Antony. But their joint rule proved to be unworkable, and Mark Antony began to look to Egypt and Cleopatra for support. When Antony and Cleopatra met, her charm and ability to discuss subjects reserved for men captivated yet another Roman general. It was the beginning of a love affair and a political alliance that would determine both of their fates and the fate of Egypt. Although Antony did return to Rome in an attempt to mend his differences with Octavian, the trip was unsuccessful and he rejoined Cleopatra for good. Whatever he may have wanted from her personally and emotionally, he also wanted money, timber for his ships, and she wanted 
further grants of territory and further political guarantees. They were always allies as much as they were lovers. Mark Antony was committed to Cleopatra and the two children she had bore him. He proclaimed that Caesarion, her son by Julius Caesar, was the legitimate heir to the leadership of Rome and presented Cleopatra with gifts of Roman land. We have the situation of a noble Roman, a great Roman general, at one point giving away parts of the Roman Empire to an Eastern queen, and that was not to be tolerated by the Senate in Rome. That's why Mark Antony was declared public enemy number one. Manipulating these feelings to his benefit, Octavian obtained the backing of the Roman army and declared war on Antony and Cleopatra. The forces of Octavian met the navy of Antony and Cleopatra at the Sea Battle of Actium in 31 BC. The Romans succeeded in surrounding the Egyptian fleet and the day belonged to Octavian. Seeing defeat, Cleopatra and Antony made their escape. Within a year, the Roman fleet entered Alexandria's harbor and the Egyptian forces surrendered. Mark Antony knew what his fate would be and he took the noble Roman way out. He fell upon his sword and committed suicide. Cleopatra knew what her fate would be. Golden chains on her wrists and ankles in a great triumph in Rome. She couldn't beguile Octavian as she had been so successful with Mark Antony and with Julius Caesar. Octavian intended to be master of the Roman world. Ancient sources tell us Antony died in Cleopatra's arms. She too was prepared to die by her own hand. Cleopatra gave orders to have a poisonous snake brought secretly to her. With her servants in attendance, the serpent coiled around her arm and executed a fatal bite. Cleopatra was 39 years old. It may not have been such a, a bad kind of death. It was actually a, a fairly normal form of capital punishment in Egypt at the time. So Cleopatra would have, have known what it was like to die this way. The moment Cleopatra took her last breath, the age of the pharaohs was over. It was a fitting end to one of the greatest love stories of all time and for the ancient Egypt civilization that lasted longer than any other. It is true that Egyptian Roman overlords continued Egyptian ritual, appeared as pharaohs and built temples to the gods. But these actions were purely for the purpose of maintaining control over the population. In reality, Egypt was just another territory, a rich land to be drained of its resources for the benefit of Rome. Unattended, the shrines and monuments built over a period of three millennia were forgotten. What wasn't defaced or looted lay helpless against the relentless wind and sand. Their colors were erased and their forms buried beneath the surface of the desert. Now the voices of the god kings were silent. The Egypt of the pharaohs, the old civilization, the great empire of the Nile had come to an end. But after all attempts by man and nature to destroy what the ancients had built, the legacy of the kings and queens of Egypt has survived. Their faces testify to the ageless glory of human nature and reveal how little it has changed since the time of the god kings, the giants, the greatest pharaohs.